calcium and phosphorus. So they show up as white in the back of the eye, little white flecks. That is asteroid hyalosis. Syngesis scintillans. I have trouble saying that one. It appears identical to asteroid hyalosis, but, the, but these particles are made of cholesterol. Okay? Both conditions may be associated with retinal degenerations or posterior uveitis, but usually it's just an old age change. Um, and if they are severe enough, like if there's enough of them, they can actually impair the dog's vision. Um, and, and, but, I, but I think most of them you know, are, are age-related. So you'll end up with, with some of these old dogs where they're already getting a little bit of retinal degeneration, uh, and then they get enough change in the vitreous to impair light getting through to the retina, and they really start to become visually impaired. If, if I see asteroid hyalosis at the time of cataract surgery, I will sometimes remove it. Like if it's severe enough, and if the dog, you know, is a, a, a younger old dog, like eight to nine years of age, then I'll remove that asteroid hyalosis at the time of the cataract surgery because I know that you know if it's a small breed and it's going to live to be 14, by the time it's 13, it may be blind from its asteroid hyalosis, even though cataract surgery went well. Um, and at 13, we don't want to have to do a vitrectomy surgery, so I'll do that vitrectomy removal right at that time of the cataract surgery. Uh, vitreal inflammation, or vitritis. The pathologists don't like you to call it that. It's not really vitritis, but we call it that sometimes. Um, it's secondary to inflammation in adjacent structures, usually. That's why they don't want us to call it vitritis. Um, because it, it doesn't have an intrinsic vasculature, so they don't think you can say that it's actually inflamed. Um, but it can be caused by chorioretinitis, trauma, or optic neuritis. Neoplasia can also call, cause vitreous. You can end up with inflammatory cells in the vitreous uh, secondary to a neoplasm. Uh, blood in the vitreous, which we see as retinal surgeons, we see all the time, because we're seeing these little shih tzus with detached retinas and lots of blood back there. Um, that blood will cause an ingress of macrophages into the vitreous. And then here's the big one. This is the important one. All those really weren't all that important. They were just taking up time because uh, I needed to fill up time. This is the big disease, vitreous cineresis. So this, this is almost always, in my opinion, a primary and when I use primary, I always mean genetic, liquefaction of the vitreous hydrogel. So the vitreous is, is one of the, the Mother Nature's best hydrogels, best hydrogel ever made, except in dogs with a genetic defect that lead to a breakdown of that hydrogel. Um, and this happens in specific breeds like the Italian Greyhound, the Whippet, uh, Shih Tzus especially, uh, in my area, the Brussels Griffin. Um, and so this is, this is a big disease, this one right here, as far as retinal surgeons go. Okay, so uh, what else? What did they mention? Uh, Chihuahua gets vitreous cineresis, Chinese crested, Havanese, the Lao Chen, Papillon, uh, but, but that's the big one, the Shih Tzu. Um, yeah, so I said that, that's fine. So that's our, this is our poster child retinal detachment dog. This is what I get sent to me quite often. Uh, both retinas will be detached, uh, and it is usually due to a primary or inherited vitreous degeneration. 
So the vitreous is almost completely liquefied, but there's conglomerates, all right, of uh, macrophages and co the collagen fibers all clump together in the middle. There's um, hemocytorin in there if it's been a chronic detachment, so you'll see hemocytorin. So there, there's a number of pathognomonic changes that you see in the vitreous, okay? Um, once that's all liquid, and then the rest of it's liquid, it's aqueous humor, all right? There's just a clump of collagen and hemocytorin in the, sitting in the middle of the vitreous, the rest of it's all aqueous humor now. Once, the, once, once it breaks down, um, you know, you're just kind of turning it over, the water over from the ciliary processes. Now we have no support for the vitreous anymore. Because don't forget, the main job and almost only job of the vitreous is to push the retina out away from the center of the eye and make sure it doesn't detach. That's what it's for. It only has one job. If it's liquid, it can't do that anymore. Right, because this is what it looks like. If you dissect that vitreous out in a young, healthy eye, it's a it's a big, beautiful hydrogel, and it just sits there. And and unless you jam something into it, you can't go towards the center. Like a, a retina can't push its way into the middle. Right, that gel is there. It's firm, and it holds the retina in place. So, but. All right, it's liquefied, but the retina is kind of sitting there. What happens? Well, we think that the aggressive head shaking behavior in these little shih tzus, lots of little dogs like to take a toy and shake their head, creates a coup contra coup effect, which tears the retina, often tears the blood vessels. That's why they end up with a vitreous hemorrhage. But once that retina is torn, the water that's there, it's no longer hydrogel, gets underneath the retina and lifts it up off the RPE. All right, so it's a combination of the liquefaction of the vitreous and the head shaking behavior. All right? Now, that actually probably doesn't do anything to the retina. That's normal head shaking. Well, no, that's a little more than normal. But it's taking the toy, right, and then you really shake. It's back and forth. It's like a boxer being hit, coup contra coup. And that's what tears the retina. And I showed you this picture, but you know, this is all that really that's left of the vitreous. Okay, that's it. Collagen fibrils. This one's blood because it's fairly fresh. Um, is it still working? Yeah? It's good? Okay. Um, but the rest of everything else out here, that's just all water. That's all aqueous humor, okay? It has no ability to protect the retina from moving one way or the other. And we saw this little video at the beginning, and you can see, if you watch now, all right, it shows up best against the non tapetum because it's white. Doggy didn't want more still. Here we go. You can see the conglomerated vitreous kind of fo unfocused here. And that's what you have to look for in the vitreous. And if you want to protect these Shih Tzus and diagnose their primary, their inherited vitreous change early, that's what you have to look for as you do your exam. And you, all you have to do is get them well dilated and then Get the retina in focus, turn your light down a bit, okay? Because if you have your light too high, you get all sorts of light off the tapetum and you can't see the conglomerated vitreous. Turn your light down a bit and just move back, focus back a little bit, and, and the posterior vitreous will come into view, and that's where you look for those changes. And if you see those, you can warn the owner that this, this Shih Tzu is, should be shaking his toys, the toys should be taken away or you're going to send them somewhere for a late prophylactic laser retina pexy, which we're not sure works, but that's theoretically what you would do. So, other diseases, 
you can get vitreous cysts. They, they, they're just cysts that arise from the posterior iris epithelium or from the ciliary epithelium instead of floating forward uh, into um, the anterior chamber. They just fall back into the vitreous. They just float around back there. Surgery is not required in any way. Uh, they're very rare. I don't even have a photograph of one, I don't think. No. Um, the asteroid hyalosis, I want to talk about that again. There are times uh, when it should be removed, I think, at the time of cataract surgery. Um, and you can see ahead of time. Like when you do your ultrasound exam, if you see this, okay, in the vitreous, you know you've got asteroid hyalosis. I mean, some ultrasounds are, you know, better than others, but I have a inexpensive ultrasound and you know you can you can see the changes so when I see this change I'm usually prepared to go in I, I'm not doing a posterior I don't get all fancy I just make a small hole in the posterior uh, lens capsule and I go in with the detractor and remove the asteroid hyalosis it's it's easy to do and it may save vision down the road that's kind of what it looks like through the pupil. I mean, you're probably going to have seen this, you know, in your preoperative assessment, but you can see the asteroid hyalosis sitting in the in the anterior vitreous, right through the pupil. Um, it does happen, as I mentioned, sometimes down the road. You know, the dog's very young, two or three, has cataract surgery, everything goes well, but then by the time it's 12, 12 or 13, they get asteroid hyalosis, and dogs will actually lose vision sometimes from asteroid hyalosis. So you've got a perfectly good eye, still got its eye well, the retina's doing okay, but you've got so much asteroid hyalosis. Those ones I will take to surgery do you know, a retinous type surgery, a pars plant of atrectomy. Uh, and those are fun because you just go in and kind of eat up all the asteroid hyalosis and it's, it's uh, an easy, you know, surgery compared to what we normally do with a retinal detachment. If we have a persistent hyaloid system in the back of the eye, and we do, and we've got a dense cataract, so that the patient, you know, you've got it already, you're going to do cataract surgery, sometimes that big plaque can be there, but you don't know it ahead of time, because there's cataracts, you can't see, you may see it on ultrasound, you may not, um, like here, you know, on this ultrasound, I can definitely see this big, uh, I don't have Doppler, so I can't, I couldn't tell if, if this was patent and had blood in it or not, but it's definitely a big persistent hyaloid coming right up to the back of the lens. If it's dense enough to impair vision, so we've removed the cataract, but now we have a big plaque in the back uh, of the posterior lens capsule, we're not gonna have vision, so we're not gonna have a successful cataract surgery, so we've gotta do something. All right, so in this patient, you know, that's that big dense plaque. I mean, yes, there's some open space here, but that's with a dilated pupil. If that dog's pupil is resting mid-range or even my and myotic maybe in bright light, um, this patient isn't going to see through that hyperplastic primary vitreous plaque. And you can also see, so you can see this patient now, right? These are vacuoles in the lens, right? It's developing a cataract. It's either due to the changes from that plaque or the gene that, that, that's faulty in the PHPV, persistent uh, hyperplastic vitreous, uh, also codes for some abnormality in the lens and causes cataract. So I did um, a couple of these where I actually went in after the cataract surgery and cauterized that primary artery, and I can cause complete ischemic necrosis of the retina. Dog came in the next day, had it looked perfectly quiet, everything was great, but the entire retina was dead. So I don't do that technique uh, anymore. We just um, basically 
cut around the plaque, so we're doing a posterior capsulorexis, and then we let the whole thing fall into the back of the vitreous, and it just hangs down ventrally from the optic nerve, and uh, that works well most of the time. I was in Brazil uh, in August and did a jungle survival tour uh, with a bunch of other veterinarians, and this is Dr. Eva Abarca from uh, Barcelona, and we're, we're drinking water out of a root. It was absolutely a fabulous experience. We were in Amazonia. Uh, it was so much fun. Um, smaller plaques, if you happen to have just a tiny plaque on that posterior race capsule that is associated with the vitri or with the hyaline system, you can just do a, a um, what's called a uh, cur posterior curvilinear capsulorexis. So it's the same thing that the cataract surgeon does with the anterior lens capsule. Now we're just doing it on the posterior lens capsule. I don't do that very often and I don't have any video footage of it, uh, but I do have video footage from a friend of mine, Dr. Henry Garcia uh, from Chicago, and uh, I'm going to try and play this so that you can see uh, what it's like to do this. Henry always has some of the best video. So he's removed the lens, and now he's against the posterior lens capsule with his cystitone. And he's made a hole. And now what he's actually doing, I don't know if it's showing up for you, it is for me. He, well, oh, sorry. Hang on. All right, we'll watch again. My bad. Um, so he makes a hole. And then through the cystitone, he's actually going to dissect the posterior lens capsule away from the front of the vitreous. All right, so he's actually using viscoelastic, and you can see it being injected here to separate the posterior lens capsule from the anterior hyaloid face. Absolutely amazing. Then he will start his tear, still using the cystitone, and then Henry always has really fancy equipment, so he's got some, some forceps, and he just goes in, and he takes that posterior lens capsule right out. Some surgeons, some cataract surgeons do this routinely, okay? Like, they don't want to get posterior capsular opacification. Now Dr. Garcia is just injecting the IOL, so that goes into the lens bag very nicely. He always, always does by manual uh, irrigation aspiration, and that's it. And, and so for, for a trained and practiced surgeon, removing a plaque on that posterior lens capsule is fairly easy. It takes practice though. So, after cataract surgery, vitreous disease is so you know, one of the most horrible complications of cataract surgery is endophthalmitis, okay? Infection in the eye after the cataract surgery. And this is kind of what the eyes look like. They're always sort of red, there's blood vessels floating around, we've got chemosis, we've got a myotic pupil, the lid might even be swollen by that point. These eyes get very hot very quickly. It's often a blinding disease. Your treatment has to be rapid and aggressive. Because the bacteria migrate really quickly from the front part of the eye, and that's where they were seated into. Your incision is in the cornea, and you've worked in the anterior chamber, but the bacteria like to go to the vitreous right away because it's an agar plate. It's a perfect growth medium, and there's no blood vessels. It's really tough for the white blood cells to get to the bacteria there, so they love it. They head straight for the vitreous, set up camp, pitch the tents, and they're there to stay. My initial treatment for endophthalmitis uh, would be an intravitreal injection of what we used to use was vancomycin, which is a great antibiotic, 
uh, a fortified cephalosporin, but also steroid. You can't put antibiotics back there, kill all the bacteria, and not expect the white blood cells to come marching in to eat up those bacteria, right? So you have to slow them down. You want to make this a little bit of a tempered process. Otherwise, yes, you've killed the infection, um, but the immune system has now killed the eye. So you, you have to put the steroids in with the antibiotics. Vancomycin has fallen out of favor now. Uh, I think it's actually fine in the dogs, but in humans there are some uh, idiosyncratic reactions to intravitreal vancomycin, and a few people developed retinal necrosis, so the, the MD uh, retinal people are not really using that anymore. One of the most commonly used things, and we'll talk about that tomorrow in the post-op uh, care portion of lecture, um, is moxifloxacin, or Vigamox. Because it's a great antibiotic, right? And you've got a bottle of that ready to go right on your shelf or at the pharmacy, Vigamox, right? And that can be injected right into the eye. And that's just the list. Don't bother writing these down. They're all on the internet. You just have to Google it, and it will tell you, uh, you know, any drug that's been used and, you know, what dosage to use and what volume to use. Most of the volumes are worked out to be 0 0.1 ml, but it's there on the internet. You don't have to worry about the slide. I just threw it up to show you that it's available, and they're all there. And this is how we would do an intravitreal injection. They're actually not all that hard. And you, you can practice on cadaver eyes. Um, you kind of need to use dog eyes because it's different for every species. And you want to be good at the species you're going to be doing it in. Um, so you could do a dog cadaver eye. This one is showing, uh, I'm not sure why they say five to seven, but. Um, in, in the dog eye, to do an intravitreal injection, you measure five millimeters posterior to the limbus, and you uh, stick your needle in at a 45 degree angle, like you're trying to hit the optic nerve head, so that you miss the lens. And as long as you do that, you will miss the lens, and everything will be fine. And you should use a 30 gauge needle. They're, they're uh, half inch or three quarters inch, anyway, um, if you email me, I can give you the exact data. Uh, and those needles are perfectly made for doing intravitreal injections. And you inject that drug into the vitreous, and if it's the right drug and you make the right diagnosis, then you are fairly likely to have success. If the infection, however, doesn't respond rapidly to the drugs that you've injected, uh, then it will need a vitrectomy. And there's specific parameters in human beings that develop endophthalmitis after cataract surgery, um, like perception only, count fingers, etc., etc. Uh, and, and they're fairly well established, and everybody adheres to them as to whether you get injected with drugs or go straight to the OR to have a vitrectomy. I was in Australia two years ago uh, to work with uh, Dr. Kelly Caruso and her husband, Dr. Cameron Whitaker, as they started up their veterinary vitreo retinal service. They were the first, uh, they're the only ones doing retinal surgery in Australia. Uh, and this was our very first patient, Jasmine. And Jasmine had bilateral retinal detachment. And uh, I did. So, so we had three dogs that week, all sheet suits, all with bilateral detachments. And, and I worked on, on the first eye, the eye we thought was the newer detachment, and then either Cam or Kelly worked on the second eye. But Jasmine was our first dog, and, uh, and she got vision back in her left eye. That was her better eye. Uh, this, her right eye, we, we knew it had been detached for a long time, but it was you know, practice time for the other surgeons as they learned to do this procedure. And Jasmine's mom uh, and her daughter drove nine hours uh, from 
can't remember what city they were in, but anyway, to Sydney and slept. Uh, we didn't realize this. Uh, they didn't have enough money to pay for both the surgery and the hotel, so they slept in their car somewhere for the three or four days that they were there. They were wonderful people, and I still get uh, emails from Jasmine's mom giving me updates, and she's still seeing and doing well, and they're happy. Dr. Caruso and Dr. Whitaker have now done 70 plus uh, retinal reattachment surgeries. They're just a uh, factory there in Australia, and uh, oh, it was a, a great pleasure to work with them. Okay, uh, we've got a bit of